In this lecture, we're going to look at navigating planning schemes. And what I'm trying to do is give you a helpful overview of where to look um, in a planning scheme and, and basically a short circuit through them. So this is the third in our five-part series. Um, when I've given this lecture in the past, I also included the statutory interpretation component because it used to be the second in a series of lectures about environmental law and so I would bring in what we've just dealt with in the last lecture and also bring in um, then planning schemes because they are interrelated topics. But um, we've already dealt with statutory interpretation and I don't want to go back over the planning act in the same way we did in the last lecture so I'm really just going to go to planning schemes pretty quickly. Okay, the problem I want to deal with is one that I acted for a developer years ago and they gave me, help, helpfully gave me permission to use it for teaching purposes. There was a, re was a really nice um, uh, fellow uh, out in Northgate and it's uh, a small development um, and we're basically going to answer the same sorts of questions but I, I want to use it for a number of reasons apart from um, uh, the consent of the client. It's also because uh, it's a deliberately simple um, common development. Uh, I don't want to just basically look at you know big things like the redevelopment of the ABC site which you know have their own bells and whistles and everyone in the kitchen everything in the kitchen sink thrown at them. But you know a development of units in a residential area is so common and it's one of the things that will most regularly annoy local residents and attract a lot of objections and so I just want to deal with it from that perspective. And uh, this time around, so we've, we've looked at one problem from an objector's perspective. Last time we looked at it from the council's perspective. <coughs> this time I want to look at it from the developer's perspective. And so let's just take it that we're acting for the developer. So the site is out in Northgate, so about what, 15 kilometres um, north of us. So if we just zoom in, so here's the site you can see coming up. And I remember when um, I was contacted by a solicitor to act in this matter, and I was excited because once you get to know planning schemes and, and the like, things like integration into transport and um, you know related issues, I uh, immediately spotted, okay, well, it's really close to Northgate Railway Station. Uh, I actually, when I went for the site visit with the solicitor, just took the train out from my chambers, got off the train and then just walked to the site to just walk the sort of connection for local residents and you know thinking of if we, you know, we're taking the judge here these are the sorts of things that I would be pointing out to the judge about its connection to transport and, and the like. So here's the site and you can see local houses so your classic uh, residential area in Brisbane. What's that running along the, the back of it, do you think? Creek. Yep, a creek. It's pretty straight for a creek, so it's more, you know, it's a creek that's been realigned um, for to be a channel or a drainage line and, you know, a line of mangroves running along it. What's on the other side of the creek? Yeah, so it's pretty clear just from looking at Google Earth. Uh, just south of it, I think, is, um, is it, there's a Australian Catholic University or something that's sort of um, not on this image but a little bit south of it. So local residents for one reason didn't want the units because they said oh, there'll be all these students that come and live in it and you know they'll have parties. And shocking. shocking I know. So here's our site. So our client's family's owned it for years so he's a small-scale developer, uh, lives in one of the neighbouring houses, owns these two blocks, family's owned them for years and, you know, so it's not a big developer wanting to do a lot. He wants to develop them and then essentially own them, you know, sell individual units. He's got two blocks, these sort of corner blocks. And I just want to turn it around a bit. So I'll just go back. See, so that's looking at it from the north, um, like you would on Google Earth. And then I'm just going to twist it around. Bec I'm doing that because I'm going to show you a couple of plans for what Peter wants to do on the sites that are in that orientation. So, and also point out there's two lots. So lot three and lot 39. 
So the you know that in Queensland we've got um, our real property system, our torrent system has a central registry yeah. and each parcel of land has an individual unique, is that a tautology? A unique identifying number that basically is really useful if you've got the lot and plan because you can put it into a lot of search functions in you know state government mapping and the like it will give you the option of choosing the lot and plan so if you've got that you can just plug it in and you'll easily find the um, lot that you're looking for um, alternatively if you're looking for information then obviously we know there's a street address um, but that can be Problematic, you know, if there's, you know, if it's 12 Queen Street, for instance, you know, how many Queen Streets are there in Brisbane? There'd be a lot. Um, so, the real property description is um, really useful. The only potential problem with it is lot numbers can change. So, if a lot is amalgamated or something, so your lot numbers, um, and I haven't found in the, I'm sure if you, if you, at least in the in the freely accessible. <coughs> Um, land registries, if you don't have, like if you've got an old um, lot and plan number, you basically your results will come up. There's, a, there's no land and it won't tell you what it became. So linking, I'm sure that um, there must be links. I just haven't seen it. So it can be a problem if you've got an old lot and plan. But um, lot and plan, very useful to note that down um, if you're going to do any searches. So here's the land, and that's the existing layout. So you can see uh, on it, there's there's two existing buildings, and then it sort of, you probably can't read the contours, but it slopes away to the creek over here. Now notice here, there's a line saying regulation line. You probably can't see that, but there's a, it's noted a regulation line. What do you think a regulation line might refer to in the context where there's a creek right beside it? Flooding. So um, the houses are on essentially the higher part of the land. And what Peter wants to do is build, and notice that the regulation line, there's nothing built beneath the regulation line. So, um, and just to you know, jump forward. There are a lot of constraints on building in watercourses, and you know things like flood overlays and the like are real hard constraints that you will run into <coughs> as a developer. If you try and build in somewhere that's flood prone or in a waterway, then um, you simply might not be allowed to do it at all because uh, you know if you fill, you know, you might say, well, I can fill my land and raise it up above, but you know we know that that just then can bank up the problem um, and flood. Um, houses upstream of you, so councils are really reluctant to allow development in waterways. So that's an example. And you know, in planning schemes, they talk about waterway over, you know, overlays related to waterways and the like. They can be real constraints. And so, what Peter had done before it came to me, like I was, as a barrister, you tend to only get involved in things when they come to litigation. So, this, there were objections from local residents and I was acting for Peter and so he'd already done all this um, before, you know, this was the application that he'd um, lodged, obviously with the assistance of town planners and architects and the like, but it was designed to comply with what was allowed on the land. So things like, you know, it's a smart proposal in the sense that if you try to build beneath the regulation line, it's the sort of thing where you're going to have a lot of problems. So. Um, the buildings are above it. It actually allowed, you know, courtyards and stuff to be there, but essentially there was nothing built beneath that regulation line. And then this is just some of the sort of images, you know. So, architectural plans. These are expensive. You know, if you've ever been involved in development, it's bloody expensive to get an architect to prepare plans for you and the like. So you're talking about tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of dollars in fees. So. I mentioned before one of the key things that the planning schemes give to you as a developer is you know what the envelope is that if you come within you should get approval for and that's a real advantage because if you're going to spend all this money in getting all these plans done up to be assessed you want to be pretty certain that the $200,000 that you spend on getting plans and engineering reports and the like 
that you're actually going to get an approval that you can then go on and make a profit off developing the land. So these are expensive. Um, you know, just, just a few different side views. So this is what the um, architect's impression look like um, from viewed from the street. So, and I've done a case study of it on my website if you wanted to look at any of the documents, but um, this is a key image really from our perspective. Now, in the middle are the two, two of the unit blocks. And um, the two buildings either side of them are actually existing houses. So what do you think, from just from a normal person's perspective, um, about the impact of that development in terms of, say, things like the residential amenity? Does it, from the street, does it sort of look like a house? Does it tower over the surrounding houses? Not at all. Similar roof line, two storeys, very, uh, it was quite, it was smartly designed and essentially there was an entrance and then there were sort of parking for the units but they sort of were stacked behind so from the road you didn't really see them. So the same question, does the development comply with the law and if not what steps need to be taken to make it comply? So from a developer's perspective, you know, can we just go ahead and build this? Do we need any approval? So um, unpacking that question you know, what laws regulate the activity, what applications are needed, if any, and if so, are the applications likely to be granted? And I really just I want to step over finding the law and interpreting the law. We talked about that in terms of the Planning Act and the like. Um, the key question becomes, um, if approval is required, is it likely to be granted? And I really want to step over the, I'll come back to the development assessment system in our next lecture and talk about things like material change of use and the like. I just want to go to the end, the big question of is it <coughs> likely to be approved what we're applying for. And um, just as a side note, um, the application requirements and legal obligations vary significantly across different forms of land tenure or land ownership. So you know about freehold land which is privately owned, it's about 70% of the state, but then Crown land, leasehold <coughs> land is a massive component of land and reserves, protected areas. One of the main reasons why you, you can't build in a, say, national park is because you don't own it. So apart from there being prohibitions under the Nature Conservation Act, but ownership is a fundamental component of the development assessment system. So <coughs> basically you need to own or have consent from the owner to apply to develop a, the land. In this case, our client owns it, so there's no problem. So um, it's quite different to, say, the mining system, where the landholder might violently object to a mining lease being granted over their pastoral lease. But the system is set up basically to facilitate the development of resources. The landholder will be compensated, but essentially you can't, you don't have a veto right um, to if someone wants to come and access minerals on your land, they can apply for a mining lease and they will you know, be forced to pay you compensation, but you can't generally stop them. Whereas in the planning system, if you're the owner of land, people can't come and build on your land um, without your consent. So not a problem in this case, um, but you know, when you think across Brisbane, there's lots of different tenures, parks and the like. One of the basic reasons why people can't build in a park is because you know they don't own it so they can't you know put in an application so we can go to the planning act um, for understanding this um, system and I we worked through that before and we saw in chapter two there was um, the ability to make um, planning instruments at a state level and a local government level and we also saw in chapter three there's a development assessment system and I like to try and uh, I often think I'm pretty, very stupid and need to basically simplify things down to a simple diagram or a single page, which is why I like you know, diagrams like I've given you of all the major pieces on one page and it's not on two pages because I can't think that much. Um, so here's my diagram and how I think of the planning system uh, in 
the Planning Act. So we've got an object of ecological sustainability and that's in Chapter 1. Then there's two big limbs, the planning framework where plans are, are created, at a, you know, regional plans and local government planning schemes in particular. So those planning documents, um, you know, there's a process in the Act for creating them, but once they're in existence, they're the key reference point for the other big limb, which is develop and assessment. So if someone wants to develop their land, the application is assessed against the planning documents. That's really the central tenet of planning throughout across the world. Uh, you, you develop a, a plan and then development is assessed against that plan. So plans typically both reflect in the the nature of the site and the land within it. So if there's you know a big river running through the area that you're planning, then your plan will you know, reflect the fact that there's a big river there. It might also reflect past development of some areas as residential and industrial before the plan came into existence. But then it, there's also a future component where the plan will look at, well, where do we as the planning authority, where do we want to allow development to occur? How are we going to control future development? So there's an element of re reflecting reality of what's there now, but also there's a future element of what do we want to stop or what do we want to constrain in the future. So the plans and the development, assist development assessment system are intricately interlinked. Now sitting in the middle of that, I think of it as, you know, the, the, the sort of the core nuts and bolts of the, what keeps it together is the offences enforcement and dis offences and enforcement system really in chapters five to six. Because if you don't have that, like if you just created a law that had no offences in it and you just said, here's a plan, um, you might be a premier of a state and you might say, we're going to give you a royalty free period coal miners, but we voluntarily, we, we want you to voluntarily contribute money to regional communities <coughs> for the next five years. Um, you might just say that and there's no penalty if you don't. So uh, how much money do you think they're going to chip in? Um, enough really for the <laughs> PR aspects of it, but nothing like what you know the law could require of them. So anyway, that's an aside, um, little bugbear. Uh, if you don't impose a penalty, or if you don't have laws that restrict development that doesn't comply with the plans, then people won't. You know, f for most people, if they could develop a hundred-story skyscraper on their land, which is riverfront land, and you know it's going to be worth you know hundred million dollars. Um, and the plan says you can only have a house and that's worth like two million dollars, then for most developers um, the only thing that stops them building the hundred stories is the fact that the law is going to fine them or there'll be orders you know forcing them to stop. So you need the offence and enforcement provisions and you need them to be enforced. There needs to be credible enforcement of them otherwise people ignore the plans. Seems obvious? Well, that is obvious, isn't it? So there needs to be that link between the two limbs. And then down the bottom, you might think repeal and transitional provision sounds really boring, and um, it, in a way it is, but it's often really important because um, lots of documents are created under previous systems. So you have to translate old documents into the current system. So the repeal and transitional provisions are um, critical for linking old planning schemes particularly to the new development assessment um, process and terminology. So um, that's a conceptual structure that I use. Um, um, in um, development assessment I think I've also included the infrastructure charges chapter um, because I just see that as effectively part of the development assessment framework. Okay, I pointed this out before that there's multiple layers in this system, state, regional and local. Um, and ironic, is it ironic the right word? It seems counterintuitive perhaps is a, is a bad, you might think that state should be where all of the detail is and you know that that's the most important. But in reality the 
the, the lower down you get, the more detail you get in this system. So for most development, it's actually the local government planning schemes that are where the controls are. They're in, you know, if you're in an urban, if you're in the urban footprint, um, then pretty well the statewide and regional stuff doesn't, you don't have to care about it. It's the local government planning schemes that are the controls on you. So yeah, there's talked about this before that you know increasingly prescriptive and detailed laws and plans have the advantage of certainty, but the disadvantage of being long and complex. The reality is for places like Brisbane, there is so much development pressure that the detailed planning schemes are a response to that. And they face thousands of applications every year. You can't possibly well you you that's, can't possibly is um, overstating it. You, you could um, basically have a vague document, but it means you end up fighting a lot. And also, if you're going to have to fight, um, you know, thousands of development applications and go to court, and if you don't know what the result will be, that's not a, an efficient system for you as a local government. So you can see why the Gold Coast and Brisbane in particular have got really long and detailed um, planning schemes. So. There's these multiple layers in the system. So the Planning Act, the planning regulations. I'll look more at the regulations um, in the next lecture on development assessment. There's a process for creating plans. I'm going to ignore that. Um, mostly, you know, unless you're a planner working in a local government or you know someone involved in the community participating in a plan making process where you're making submissions, then you know for most problems, you've already got an existing planning scheme and the question is can we do what we want to do on the land under the existing planning scheme? So can I just leave plan making to one side? And similarly the state planning policy, the SPP, is really about state planning issue issues and then they're supposed to be incorporated into regional plans and local government planning schemes and so for the Brisbane City Plan that's been done, so like the state level SPP doesn't isn't relevant to us for here. Now when we go to the Act and we're looking at a project like this, um, we, we did in the previous lecture go and see that in, there's chapter three with development assessment and basically for the development assessment um, there's a couple of key provisions, section 45 and section 60. Uh, again I'll talk about that in the next lecture but they're essentially the key sections for um, code and impact assessment and the tests of approvals um, for them. Um, chapter 8, the transitional provisions can be really important for the old references to the old terminology under the old Act. Um, so, and that's linked with the de development assessment <coughs> rules. So what I think I mentioned before, the, in creating the Planning Act, one of the key things that the state government wanted to do was to simplify the planning system, planning legislation. How they achieved that was they, take, they took a lot of the detail that used to be in the legislation and they shoved it into um, subsidiary documents like the DA assessment rules so that you then have a shorter chapter on development assessment in the Act but you have this related document that um, you still have to look at. So, um, you know, it's only 38 pages, the DA assessment rules, um, but you have to basically read them together because the process is occurring uh, under in the in the Act as well as um, in accordance with the DA assessment rules, and um, at a state level, you get a whole range of state level triggers listed in the regulations. And if you trigger something at a state level, it's assessed against the state development assessment provisions. Um, which basically deal with you know vegetation clearing and the like. That's not relevant particularly for local government assessment. Um, the next level down is you know from the sort of state level regulations and and state development assessment provisions you might think of as regional plans, and so these came in risk they they started around two thousand and three so. Um, about 20 years ago we didn't have regional planning in um, in Queensland at all. It was There was only sort of, there was pretty well hardly anything at the state level. We had SPPs and the like, but it was really local government planning schemes. And then around 2003, 2004, I think that those were the years, it really looked like um, the, 
that Brisbane and the Gold Coast were looking to merge and so there, there would just be this continual um, sort of urban strip um, and then potentially also the cities linking up to the north. So there was a... Am I going to say something good about the Courier Mail? I think I am. The <laughs> Courier Mail led a, this public campaign about urban sprawl and it forced the state government at the time, I think Peter Beattie, to bring in regional planning, which was a pretty damn obvious thing that was needed, but it was really an, a response to the southeast Queensland urban sprawl. And the key thing that it brought in was the urban footprint. So the idea that urban development in these areas can't move outside the urban footprint. Now regional planning has been rolled out into <coughs> other parts of the state, but it was southeast Queensland that really drove it. And the key thing in it is really the urban footprint. And then you get down to the local government's um, plans. The current one at the Brisbane City is um, the Brisbane City Plan 2014. I think it's about a thousand pages. It's, I never, you never see a physical document now and, and they're difficult to print out. My old versions of the, um, of the plan you know, are in two volumes. I'm assuming it's like a thousand pages. It's a big document. Sorry? Um, and you see there I've put the table of contents um, so there's key transitional terminology um, to link old plans to the new system. You might see that um, in the um, Brisbane City Plan is 2014. The new Act is 2016. There's some changes in terminology. But what has happened, I'll come to it in a moment, but what has happened is the Brisbane City Council has updated their planning scheme to reflect the new terminology. Um, in terms of use of res resources for finding them, um, you know, most people, once you know, you'll just go straight to the local government website and there's good PD online um, pages on all of the big um, local governments like Brisbane, Gold Coast, you know, others. Um, the planning department's website also has links across um, to them, so that's just a screen grab of it. So if you go to it, it will, you know, allow you to link. And yeah, there's some useful resources now for mapping particularly the urban footprint. So you can go into the DA assessment mapping system um, on that website and, and do things like look at the um, regional plan. So let's just do that for our land. I could go and do it, but let's just, you know, I've done it to save us time. Um, could click on the links, um, search for the lot and plan. And basically you can see pink there is the urban footprint. And the basic thing the regional plan says, urban development is only allowed in the urban footprint. So basically you want to be in the pink. We're a, we, we want um, to build 10 units, so urban development. We want to be in the pink. So if we you know, zoom in, there's our land. It's looking good, isn't it? Um, this is, like if you go there now and look at it, because this development actually occurred and has been approved and the, it's been built, um, but the, the colours are still the same from what it was when the application went through. So it was all pink. And you can see there those other layers are about um, flooding. And um, yeah, so it's in the pink, so it's within the urban footprint. So basically, pretty well that's for us from a developer's perspective. There's tick, yep, comply with the regional plan. Um, let's get on to looking at the local government planning scheme. So, and that's where the bulk of the detail is. And you just interpret them according to ordinary principles. Um, I suppose the one thing with um, I've put there is they're just interpreted according to ordinary rules of statutory interpretation, but with an emphasis on not taking overly technical or pedantic approach. That's what the p &E court says, basically. Use your common sense, read it. Don't look for every minor inconsistency. Your planning schemes are so big and complex, you'll always find some bit of inconsistency. So broad, you know, broad brush, not overly technical, but really what they're doing is just looking at the plain meaning. If the planning scheme is really clear that this development is, you know, shouldn't go ahead, then that's it. It's just like a, um, it's where it's, you know, you have difficulty is often where it's not clear um, and often that becomes a factual issue. So don't be overly technical, but all we're doing when we're looking at a planning scheme is just those basic rules that we you know, have already talked about. So. The old planning, the, the planning scheme that this, this one was actually assessed against was the Brisbane City Plan 2000, but it doesn't really make a difference because there hasn't, for 
this particular site and for low density residential, the key things are still the same. So the old structure of the Brisbane city plan I just mentioned, so I used to like this diagram because it looks a bit like a, if anyone remembers, not Daleks, what is it, Pac-Man? I sort of think of this as one of those little Pac-Man. So there's a strategic plan, you know, the broad brush stuff for the, um, for the local government planning area. What used to be called area plans, um, when the Integrated Planning Act came in in 1997, uh, there are a lot of problems that we're still dealing with. One of them was that they gave very little guidance to local governments on what the um, what planning schemes should contain, and also they wanted there was a real emphasis on outcome-based planning, and they wanted to get away from the idea of zones. Ironically, we've come back to zones, but for quite a while councils avoided referring to zones in their planning schemes. So Brisbane called them areas. And so what are now called like a low density residential zone used to be a low density residential area under the Brisbane city. But they're basically the same thing. So if you think of like a, a topic that might be spread across your planning area, like residential or like industrial, <coughs> then they're sort of common forms of development that you basically want to group together or have common um, then if you think about the other side, which is the local plans or neighbourhood plans, there might be areas where there might be multiple different uses going on, but you want to have a consistency geographically, like the Brisbane CBD or South Bank. So you can develop little micro plans, local plans, neighbourhood plans. And then underneath that, you've got planning scheme policies, codes and priority infrastructure plan at that time. So infrastructure has always been a big deal, trying to basically allocate how you charge people um, for you know, development in an area, how you charge them for the infrastructure that council has put into, you know, that you're connecting into. What's if the value of you know, Brisbane's sewerage system might be $10 billion. How do you charge an individual new high-rise development in um, you know, South Brisbane to connect into that system? What is their contribution to that system? It's really hard to actually work out what is a contribution to a broader network. So um, codes um, were developed to deal with you know, common issues like um, acid sulfate soils or vegetation management or something that you wanted to address um, that was a specific topic. And so that was the sort of terminology that, that evolved under the Integrated Planning Act. Um, Brisbane in the City Plan 2000 sort of led the way for the state and um, then basically we come to the Brisbane City Plan 2014 and the current system we've come back to the state government wanting to be basically in 1997 they allowed local governments to go out and do whatever they wanted and outcomes based we want to basically let a million flowers flourish and you know we'll harvest the best and you know we'll learn from it. it's a really this utopian planning bullshit um, that really didn't work um, and no one really understood outcome based planning it really I just remember being so frustrated I was working for the Department of Environment up in Townsville back in 98 when when IPA came in and we came and got this um, presentation from the planning department you might have thought they'd come from Mars for all they actually knew about the reality of planning and it seemed to work on the basis that um, as a department you got this perfect application that had all the information you needed and you could just assess it like tick 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 and the reality is you get applications that are you know people don't understand the system they don't understand the information you need they might have misunderstood the whole system you know trying to unpick what they understand and what they don't without telling them what to, you know they can and can't do is really hard often it's real it's you, you it's not a perfect system and you don't get perfect applications. So we've come back gradually through the iterations over the last decade and a bit to having quite prescriptive um, uh, framework from the state government that local governments are now changing their planning schemes to deal with and so there's much more consistency in things like definitions of t key terms like you know what is a hotel or what is a you know a restaurant or 
key terms instead of having you know different local governments with different definitions there's now sort of more trying to for more consistency but it's if you're dealing with the mess that was there before it's still trying to basically fix up that mess anyway we come now then to the Brisbane City Plan 2014 and basically just to step through it use the same you use the same basic skills you know, find the relevant version. So if we wanted to develop this now, it would be under the um, City Plan 2014, not the old one. Um, you can skim read it. The key thing, though, in terms of skim reading it, and this is the key... <coughs> what do they talk about in, in IT? The hack or, you know, the, the workaround, the simple way you solve a complicated problem? The simple key thing that you need to do to work out planning schemes is to realize they're always a combination of maps and text and you use the maps to identify the relevant parts of the text so yeah they can be re really long and complicated but basically what you do is you identify you use the maps to identify you know what zone are we in for instance and once you identify what zone you're in you can then go and look at the relevant provisions that apply to that zone and you can then ignore all the information on the other zones because they're not relevant to you. And you can also then identify, are you in a particular neighborhood plan area? And also whether any overlays apply to you, you know, so is there a water course mapped across your land and the like? So you use the maps to identify the relevant parts of the text. So that's the key. And once you've found the information on the maps, you then go, yeah, to the text. And that the text then provides you with the detailed constraints um, and you might like if you are living on a in an area and you know you're in the low density residential area then obviously you don't need to go and look at a map but that's because you already know it if there's a site and you don't know what it's zoned as how do you find that out well you can do a property inquiry but if you know and that might tell you it's in this zone but effectively that's by reference to a map so for instance if we just look at our land that we're developing, uh, and I just want to emphasise that key point um, that I made before, that plans reflect both a combination of physical reality as well as future planning intent. So on the top I've got some layers from the planning scheme, and at the bottom I've got the key to it, but in the middle I've put like a, an extract from um, Google Earth, which you know we all know um, we're used to using, so we can see the water course and you can see there on the plan you can see the shaded area is a waterway so down here I've kept see it, that hatched area is a waterway so we can see that there's a waterway mapped across the area um, the pink is low medium density residential area Oh no, actually, sorry, it's the next one down. The low density residential area, that's a darker pink. And often it might be difficult to tell the difference between the, sh the shades in the, in the key. And you might go and do a property inquiry so that it you can actually identify what one it is. Because sometimes the, sh the shading. So, um, but here it's a low density residential area. And um, then the purple is a heavy industry area. And we can see that actually on the ground. And now that's under the old um, Brisbane City Plan 2000, but now you just change those references to areas into zones effectively. So the areas are spread all across the city. Um, big green there being you know, the conservation areas, but you know, it's this patchwork quilt of different zones. So when you look at in it a, a block of land like our one, so this is the superseded Brisbane City Plan 2000 using areas and this is the same block all I've done is change the layer looking at PD online and going into that land and you can see there so this is the old superseded areas here's our block and this is it under the new city plan you can see there's basically no change we're just talking about zones now so we know um, that it's in this area and then 
Can I actually just go to the city plan just once, just to... So let's just go to give you an example of <coughs> brisbane.qld.gov. So we go into <coughs> the council website and go to um, planning and development and we go, go to PD online. Um, I won't go there right now. Let's just go to the city plan. We already know, we've, the key thing we've got from um, going to the PD online and looking at the maps is we know we're in the low density residential zone. So we can go to the city plan and again we can just skim read it. Go into the city plan and again use the table of contents. Um, you can look at the structure but a key thing that I just, you know, in your skim reading of it um, um, I just point out this early provision, it's been updated to reflect the terminology under the new Act. So uh, even though it's a 2014 plan, it's using the new terminology. Then we know we're in the, um, the zones, uh, sorry, part six deals with zones, which, you know, we could look at the planning scheme and look at the relevant parts, understand its structure, and we find that zones are the key, you know, a key um, measure that's used to constrain um, development. And we need to look at, you know, local, the um, uh, neighbourhood plans and overlays and those sorts of things. But let's just focus on the zone, just for the idea. So um, if we're looking at the zone, there's a range of codes for residential zones, we can go to the low density um, residential zone and we can read about what's supposed to be allowed in that zone. Um, <coughs> low density residential zone, the purpose of the low density residential zone is to provide for a, a variety of low density dwelling types, uh, including dwelling houses. Sorry, I should say, we're reading this from the perspective of we're acting for PETA and we want to put units. So is that development going to be consistent with the zone. So we're reading the, the purpose of the zone. So a, low, sorry, a var variety of low density dwelling types, including dwelling houses, community uses, um, zone. So it's basically about low density dwelling. So it's our 10 units. We get down to paragraph four, development location and uses overall outcomes are development other than dwelling house including dual occupancy or multiple dwelling um, is not accommodated within this suburban setting unless it is a well located site of over 3,000 square meters so we've got a number there um, but essentially reading the intent of the zone um, multiple dwelling development, like units, um, isn't located there unless it's on a site over 3,000 square metres. So let's just say that that's a key constraint on it. We could go and look at a whole range of other things in terms of height and bulk and the like. Um, but basically, um, we have to be on a site over 3,000 square metres is one of the key considerations or a consideration in the planning scheme. Sorry, yes, Margaret? Um, well located. Yep. Where well located site. How does one interpret well, located? well, these are the intended outcomes. So, you know, if we thought about this site uh, in terms of access to transport, oh. it's really close to Northgate Railway Station. You know, is it basically a site where you want higher density? Yeah. Yeah. So you get these what's intended, um, and you go through into a whole heap of things like you know, gross floor areas and the like, but that's the intent of the zone and I'll just, let's just um, keep it simple and that 3,000 square metre number, keep that in mind. Um, in terms of whether development is required, the, the planning scheme set up tables of development which basically you go through and look at for a list of triggers and so if we're looking at um, the types of development. Um, if we're changing, and 
talk about material change of use in the next lecture, but we're going from essentially um, houses to units. So it's a new use of the land, so there's a material change of use. So we look at um, categories of development and assessment, material change of use, and then again, it allows us to basically drill down to low density residential. So again, we can ignore the vast bulk of the planning scheme because once we've identified what zone we're in or, and also what we're doing, we can just drill down into it to get to the key provisions. And so in a low density um, residential zone, um, and again, these have been updated to reflect um, current terminology, but if you want to have a caretaker's accommodation, it's accepted development subject to compliance. We're not caretaker's accommodation. Um, care located uses, that's not us. Dwelling house, that's not us. Home based business, that's not us. We're not building a park. We're not doing a relocatable home park. We're not a residential care facility. We're not a retirement facility. Well, we're not room accommodation. We're not a tourist park. We're not utility installation. And then so we're not any of those earlier uses which might require lower levels of assessment. We fall into what I, I often call the bucket at the end. So the typical thing you do is you set up a series of triggers as a planner and then you say anything else goes into the, essentially the highest level of assessment. So yeah, I call it the bucket. So any other use not listed in this table, um, then it's impact assessable. Um, and it's assessed against the planning scheme. So that's our trigger and that's our level of um, uh, assessment um, under it. So, um, and that's pretty easy to work out once we know where to look and once we know what zone we're in. So we know that um, what we're proposing is accessible development, it's impact accessible and it's assessed against the planning scheme. So then that sends us off into a whole range of other parts of it. But can I just bring it back to um, the 3,000 square metres, because I just really want to keep this simple. There's a whole range of constraints on this site, but two key ones are, if you go and look at all of the acceptable solutions and the like for, for the low density residential zone, and you want to put mul um, multiple unit dwelling on it, then a key thing is um, you've got to be over 3,000 square metres block or land, and you've also got to have development that's basically consistent with the residential amenity of the area. So um, I mentioned that we've got current terminology. There are transitional provisions if the, if the planning scheme hadn't been updated, but we don't need to worry about those transitional provisions. Um, we've been and looked at the zones, um, the, the low density residential zone. We know about 3,000 square metres. We also know that it's impact accessible development. If we look at the land that we've got, we've got two blocks, and if you add them together, we've got 1,723 square metres and 2,228 square metres, gives us 3,951 square metres. Now, a lot of the land is beneath, is in an area that's flood prone, but that doesn't matter for the, essentially for the, the planning scheme. We've got this large area, these large, large amount of land, and effectively it gets us over the 3,000 square metre um, hurdle. And even though our development is basically located on, on only half of the land, we still basically meet that requirement that we've got a, because the 3,000 square metres is a fair bit of land. You know, most people are on a, you know, 450 square metre block or, you know, that's your standard sort of house block or a 600 square metre block is, you know, a large house block. So 3,000 square metres is, you know, quite a, quite a large number of normal house blocks. So here our development has that and then if we went and looked at all the other acceptable solutions and all of the other intent for the low density residential zone and we say broadly they require it to be consistent with the low density residential amenity of the area, then if you look at our development, development, and this is where I was in my office doing little cartwheels for this development thinking, oh, this is great, we're just gonna you know, walk through this for the appeal because you look at that sort of um, artist impression of it and 
it's, I think, hard to distinguish between the units in the middle and the houses on either side, you know? The developer here is not going for a 100-storey, massive, towering, you know, um, skyscraper in a residential area, which would just be so incompatible with the residential nature of the area. Um, it is a low set um, from the street, looks broadly like houses. So if you can find a unit development that looks, is more consistent with residential amenity <coughs> than that, um, I would be surprised. I think this is a pretty, a real, a really good example of mul a multi-unit dwelling in a residential area that is broadly consistent with the <coughs> low density residential uses of it. So we went to um, court and the local residents, um, oh sorry, I should, I'll tell you the postscript um, at the end. Um, the key thing that I want to a key thing that I want to emphasise is um, we know that we're basically consistent with the planning scheme and the key test for whether an application will be approved is really a combination of two sections in the Planning Act, section 45 and section 60. A very useful reference if anyone um, is interested, but there's this recent decision by um, Judge Williamson um, Ashvan Investments Unit Trust and Brisbane City Council. It's only from April. Um, the Planning and Environment Court has been basically dealing with how this new, what the new tests, um, what they mean. Because under the old system, there was a sort of two step test between conflict and then whether you have, if you found conflict, whether there was sufficient grounds to allow the development despite the inconsistency. And there was a whole heap of case law on the bigger the inconsistency, the stronger your grounds needed to be. There was a whole heap of Court of Appeal decisions about it. And that was one of the sort of key things that the Bell decision about the, um, the um, redevelopment of the ABC site, that's one of the key, it was under the old system. So the Planning and Environment Court has been sort of grappling over the last couple of years with what the new tests are as they start to face applications because the legislation clearly decided to be vague about what the key test would be. Um, it's clear for code accessible development. So for code accessible development, it must be approved to the extent that the development complies with all of the assessment benchmarks from the development. You get that from 45 and 60 combined. Um, I still think that overall you can think of the rule is if a proposed development is consistent with the planning scheme and other planning instruments, it's likely to be approved. That's your basic rule. Why do I say likely? Um, when, you know, why, why don't we say, well, code assessment must be approved? Well, that's true in a technical sense. But the reality is applications are often quite complex and factually, um, you can have a factual disagreement about whether you're in compliance or not depending on the individual nature of the applications. And so I don't think it's, it's not like a cookie cutter sort of tick the box exercise for whether code assessment, code accessible development actually complies with all of the um, assessment benchmarks or not. It's v very rarely, I think, um, just, I shouldn't say that. I get a sort of strange view on the planning system and I always need to be careful in talking about it because things only come to barristers when there's a conflict so we tend to see the hard cases um, and so I'm always conscious when I'm tr trying to talk about the planning system to try and look at something like the Tornabini application where things are actually simple um, so I'm just from my experience I'm um, quite um, it's not often not a black and white answer whether something does actually comply with the code codes or not. If it does, then if it's code accessible and it complies with all these assessment benchmarks, then yes, it must be approved under the law. Um, I think it's better though just to say it's likely to be approved because often there will be factual disputes about compliance. So the bottom line is if you comply with the planning scheme and other planning instruments, you're very likely to be approved as a developer. Conversely, if a proposed development is not consistent with the planning scheme and other planning instruments, 
it's likely to be refused unless there's sufficient relevant matters. And that's what the, the new act has turned away from using the word grounds um, and now says that basically the decision maker can refer to relevant matters. And it doesn't define that, but it includes things like planning need. So that's the argument that, well, the planning scheme might have said that this was to be a low-density residential area, but there is such a need for multi-unit dwellings now because there's like, you know, you bring in a real estate um, uh, expert and you know that real estate experts are always really reliable when, um, <laughs> when you're talking about, you know, the, the demand for, for land development. So you bring them in and you say, oh, I've got 3,000 people have come through my office since yesterday morning looking for multi-unit dwellings just in this area. Not quite. But you, know, you basically say there's this need for this form of development. And then that becomes a, an argument for allowing the development even though it mightn't be consistent with the planning scheme. So um, it's called relevant matters. Um, there's a really, if you, what I want to do is avoid going into the detail, um, but there's a really interesting discussion by Judge Williamson in that judgment from paragraphs 35 to 86 about what all that means and the new tests. And if you are a planning nerd like me, I really um, recommend going and having a look at it. It's the best treatment I've seen by the Planning and Environment Court. There have been some earlier decisions about, you know, the new tests. Um, and Judge Williamson actually is at pains to, to disassociate himself from the earlier tests. So he wouldn't like my summary at all. But I also don't, I think that, um, I'm not convinced that, uh, how, to, how to put it, there's still, there's going to be more litigation about what these tests mean and it hasn't, I haven't seen it, there's nothing really gone to the Court of Appeal yet. And it just seems absolutely logical, this point that if you're not consistent with the assessment benchmarks and therefore inconsistent with the planning scheme, the more you're inconsistent, the harder it is to get approval. The more you need relevant matters to be in your favour. You know, some, um, so the bigger the inconsistency, the, the bigger the argument you need to overcome that inconsistency. So if the planning scheme says nothing more than two storeys on this site and you want a hundred storey building, then that is a massive inconsistency as opposed to you want three storeys and because of the slope of the land, um, it really will only look like two storeys from, you know, from the street. So you might have a good argument there to get three storeys because of the topography of the land. And you're, not, you're only at the margins anyway. So you're inconsistent, but there's good arguments for why you should allow the development, as opposed to wanting 100 storeys. So it just seems completely logical that the more you're inconsistent, the harder it is to get approval. But what Judge Williamson is doing and the p &E Court has been doing is saying, well, relevant matters is undefined. Um, uh, you know, there's a broad discretion here. And then it becomes, well, what then guides your discretion? What is the test? And they're grappling with it. I think the end point will be something similar like the previous test. Yeah, a bit looser, but it's logical that the greater the inconsistency, the harder it is to get approval because otherwise you know, the planning scheme becomes basically pointless. And that can't, that's clearly not the intent of the um, legislation or the scheme. So really interesting discussion, um, which I just summarise in the, these two slides. The core of our planning system is that if you apply for something that's consistent with the planning instruments, it's likely that it will be approved. And if you apply for something that's not consistent with it, then you can have troubles unless you can <coughs> justify why you should be allowed to, to do that development. And you will have more troubles the, the more you want to ask for. You know, the greater the leniency you want, the harder it becomes. And so that's why, you know, a good professional, like if you're a town planner and you're acting for a developer, you give them advice on what the planning scheme allows and then, you know, they want to push the boundaries. But, you know, if they want to do something that's, you know, ridiculous, <coughs> then, you know, you should, you know, you've got to push back and say, well, look, 
if we do that, we're going to end up in a whole heap of litigation. BCC will re reject it. There's no way they're going to approve this. It's going to be really expensive. If we temper it down, you know, pull a few stories off, you bring your development back to something that's maybe a little bit over, but you think can be justified, then, you know, that's where you can operate at comfortably as a professional. But doing something that's completely inconsistent with the planning scheme, you can't just rely upon the, 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 the ambiguity in Section 60 in the new test, I think. And I don't think anything in what Judge Williamson says really is contrary to that. Although he doesn't want to say the old test, that there's some relationship between the conflict and the grounds. He's trying to avoid that language. I don't think that it's really, though, the end of the day material. Lots of quizzical looks around the room. Any questions? I, I could come and kiss you for raising car parking because car parking was one of the key things that the local residents were concerned about. Yep, and basically we went into um, mediation with them and they said, look, we know we're stuffed on the... They had someone, I think, who was a, either worked for council, they knew that basically under the planning scheme everything ticked the boxes, but they said we're really concerned about car parking and also traffic safety as you come out as cars access it. And they wanted some... Um, not parallel parking, what's it called, where you park behind someone? Tandem. Tandem oh, parking? Tandem. 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 Yeah, so they wanted some tandem parking, and council don't like that because it causes all sorts of problems. But from our perspective, we didn't care, it was just a bit of paint on the ground. We were happy to give them extra parking spaces where they're basically cars parked behind each other. And they also wanted a mirror. Um, on the entrance to the, and which, I don't know what they cost, 500 bucks or something, but from our perspective, we could resolve the appeal. We could either go and you know, spend $30,000 on an appeal, or we could reach agreement with them to resolve it with basically the cost of a bit of paint on the ground and a, a reflective mirror. Guess which option we went for. <laughs> But I really just want to emphasise this key point. If, you know, if you're consistent with the planning scheme, it's likely you get approval. The more you go away from what the planning scheme allows, then the harder it gets to be approved. Okay. The other issue is, um, you know, if you're a developer and you're there for a long time and the plan comes up comes open for a review, then you can go in and lobby for your land to be, you know, the zoning to be changed or. You know, so you can often, in large developers typically, you know, can be involved in plan making, go in and lobby. And if the council changes the planning scheme to allow, um, you know, greater density or something like that, then you basically, are, you have resolved the problem of the application process as the developer. So if you hold land for a long time, you've got a real interest in, in upzoning it. Mm -hmm as it's called, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, it's, and it's, it's from a community's nice. perspective, um, yeah. it's often not until development is about to start that people become concerned when that's typically, from a planning perspective, the horse is bolted when the yeah. plan was made. So if it's been zoned for future urban, and what they're proposing is urban development, then you have great difficulty in resisting that. Certainly the heights that you talked about sound problematic, but you know, in terms of broadly stopping urban development in an area that's zoned for future urban, you've already lost the fight from basically the plan has been amended. So I said I wasn't going to deal with plan making, but a key issue for community people is, you know, people typically don't have the resources, but you know, being involved in the plan making process, you know, like you said, if you live on North Strabroke Island or or you know somewhere that's really um, beautiful and you want to protect the local amenity, then you know if you see a notice about um, revisions to the local government planning scheme, then you know making submissions, going and working on community campaigns to have the planning scheme properly reflect what you want to protect in your area is critical because otherwise um, you come to fighting individual development applications and you've already lost if the planning scheme allows the development that you don't want in the area. And so there's a real disadvantage in terms of community groups don't have the resources and people don't aren't focused on often on, on areas from development. Whereas if you're a developer and you own this land, you know, you have a real interest in having it developed. Um, you know, you can go and lobby to have it changed, uh, upzoned. So um, 
it's a real disparity in the system, but it's the world we live in. And so I'm just really emphasising the key uh, points. The, the, this site has uh, probably a 12 year history yeah. to it. And the rezoning application was actually knocked back by council yeah. on the basis of community objection. Yeah. And then they turned there, there are some, uh, yeah. So there are so, ma so many examples that, case. yeah, I could, or we could go into, but yeah, I, I'll just wrap up this one, this simple one. So to answer our problem, does the proposed development comply with the law? And if not, what steps need to be taken to make it comply? Well, we, it's, we, we know that it requires a development application. It's impact accessible, so it's subject to public notification. Um, so we need to go through that process to get an approval. Um, and it was consistent with the, basically broadly consistent with the planning scheme. Just as a postscript, um, it was developed. So here's the houses, um, site cleared being built and then um, that's it basically finished and that's what it looks like in Google Street View. I don't actually see our reflective mirror that's supposed to be there <laughs> but <laughs> I'm sure that that's just an error in Google Street View. Okay so that's the, that's the original streetscape view. This is what it actually looks like from you know Google Street View. So, okay, so that's just wrapping up. Um, that development application was meant to be simple and the core things that I wanted to emphasize are planning schemes provide the majority of detailed controls and they're comprised of maps and text and you need to read them together. Uh, and if the proposed development is consistent with the planning scheme, it's likely to be approved. And if it's not consistent, it's likely to be refused unless there's sufficient relevant matters such as planning need to justify it. Again, Judge w William Sudden wouldn't like my summary of that, but I just see it's inherent in um, the more you get away from the planning scheme, the harder it is to get approval. And ultimately, yeah, the greater inconsistency, the harder it is to get approval.